All right. So not a whole lot else happens in this track. Uh, synth wise. So let's start talking about drums. <laughs> So when I started making this track, it was actually kind of a joke. Um, I called it "Codename the Hardest Track," that's because I was just gonna go balls out stupid with how I mixed it and how hard things hit. And I did a pretty good job with that front. It's not necessarily actually the hardest track possible, but it's still pretty freaking hard. And one of the things that I did that I don't normally do, which is layered a whole bunch of kicks and snares, like I normally just kind of stick with one kick and one snare, and then EQ it and compress it until I get something that I like that I like. And I just, I did that. I decided to just do and do things. So these are kind of messed with a little bit. I have, um, I changed how uh, long they are by engaging uh, the in and out function here so that, because some of them, the release was a bit much because I'm also using it as a sidechain source for the, the entire track. So the uh, sidechain amount had to be controlled by the, instead of using the release function in the actual limiter, which is what I used to sidechain, I controlled it by uh, actually shortening the length. Like normally. I also reversed the polarity of a couple of these because uh, they were not uh, totally in sync with their phase, which meant that there was some phase cancellation and it actually made the bass go away. I didn't want to do that. So... That's what that is. Now, there are some snares. Um, I get all. I get these samples. These are all samples from the uh, Groove Machine library. I mentioned this every time I talk about drums. Um, Groove Machine is a live performance, like Groove Box type stuff that ImageLine has produced, and uh, to facilitate being a little mini performance object. It has a whole bunch of samples and stuff inside it, and they're all really good. So I just use that. It's more or less what I do. Um, anyway, mixing-wise, I have the kicks and the snares all bust to their individual kick and snare. I also have a whole bunch of hats doing a bunch of different things. And I have the kick, as you can see, it's side-chained everywhere. It has a, there's a main sidechain bus, which a lot of the things are going into. Then I also have kicks doing individual sidechain antics and things like the leads, lead reverb, and the main bass and whatever, just so that um, I have more control over what is being pumped, which is what's causing that pumping thing. Because like, if I look at the main sidechain bus here. That's what that that that's what that is. Um, I have a video called "Side Chaining for Fun and Profit," which explains how all that works, and I will leave you to look at that. Um, it's on my channel. It's pretty recent. So, um, in the main drum channel, I have the kicks gone to uh, uh, side chaining the hats as well, which is interesting. Which is causing that kind of like slide going on on the uh, what reverb there is in the track and what and whatnot. And a couple of these hats, I have um, extra rhythmic things going on in the form of delay. What's interesting is that this delay that has the uh, low pass filter on it is set up as such that the uh, when the delay hits, when you hear it hit, it actually doesn't sound like the same instrument. It sounds like a different instrument. Which is interesting. So um, in the sidechain bus, I have a, a Maximus here. Uh, 
multi-band limiting all the, the synths that are running through it together. For extra bit of glue. Of course, I have things that aren't going into that into that bus as well. That are going out into the master, which is fine because in the master, I'm doing more or less the same thing. And I am ensuring that um, most things are just unbelievably loud because, again, this was codenamed the hardest track. So the whole point of me doing this track was that I was just trying to be as loud as I could possibly be. Which I'm sure I'll find better ways to do it in the future, but that's just whatever. Um, so the lows are being limited so that there's not distortion on the lows yet at this point anyway. The mids are just being midi. I didn't do a whole lot of crushing on the mids just because I didn't actually want them to be that loud. And then the highs, I actually, here's the thing. I actually had it originally set so that it was uh, going out straight like this. But when it does, you can kind of hear that there's a bit of sh uh, not enjoyable sharpness where the high frequencies are distorting too much. And so I brought it, brought it a bit down. And uh, that creates a more a, a rounded feeling in the high frequencies. And I actually like that more. So I decided to keep that. Um, Maximus, as a, as a compressor, um, does is a multi-band compressor, but it, it does do normal compression things, but you kind of notice they're lacking various uh, knobs, like the uh, ratio, knee, and threshold knobs. And that's because all of that is being controlled by this graph here. Now, most of the time you are greeted with this graph in other compressors, you can see the graph, but you're seeing the graph in terms of it being affected by the knobs, but instead of that, you're just controlling it directly. So like, Right now, this is, this is an in-out graph, so for every one in, you get every one out. And if I moved it, for every one in, you're getting slightly more out. That's kind of what that is. Same thing with this. Like, now, for every one in, you're getting a lot out. I could also take this and just do that. <laughs> but damn, feedback, so I'm not going to do that. But that's how this compressor works. It's multiband, and so the whole point of a multiband compressor is that... Um, if you, it's the point of a compressor is that you're crushing down high peaks above that are above zero dB. And um, this line in the center here is zero dB. So you're bringing down those peaks. So that's fine. But like, like uh, if I, if I were only using main master compression without any of the low, mid, and high, if I were to have a really loud bass sound that's louder than everything else, it would crush down that peak that's from the bass. And, but in doing that, it will crush the other frequencies in, 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 as a result. And we don't really want that. It's not a very transparent uh, compression. So if you have multi-band compression and you have a very high peak in the bass, it'll crush the peak in the bass in the low band, but it won't affect the mids or the highs. And then they'll do their own compression and their own crushing and all that, whatever. And so that makes for a more uh, transparent mix. However, this track is not very transparent. This, the whole point of this track was not to be transparent, but this is a very helpful thing when you are trying to be transparent. And I'm just explaining how Maximus works. Now you're seeing you're seeing right now that I don't really have any compression going on, but it is still it's still being crushed at zero dB. Why is that? That's because I have soft saturation engaged. And soft saturation, like I, I, like I, just, I a little, 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 soft saturation, like I described before, in the distortion type in Harmer, is distortion. It's and it's causing distortion by completely crushing the sound as it reaches zero dB, like is really hard and that's a type of distortion that's because uh, that's what peaking is it's, it's distortion but instead of it actually just being a type of distortion as a result of peaking it's soft saturation so that's what i have that's what i have going on for these and also the mids and the highs and as well as the drum mix which i didn't look at because i'm smart um so actually let's talk about the drum mix for <sighs> fraps Talk about the drum mix anyway. So, um, the the buses that all have compression on it are uh, the individual sounds that I wanted to augment with it with the Maximus, which are it was not necessarily a mixing thing, but it is more or less a textural thing. Um, I had the drum the drum bus, which is mixed for hardness. So again, here I have the bass. I have the bass uh, not distorting. I'm just using that basically to level it, and then the mids are distorting. And then the highs are also distorting, but not as much. Because again, when you have high frequency distortion on things like hats, it doesn't really sound that good. 
And then the master is also just the sword. But I also wanted the kind of uh, compression-y uh, depth, like artifact that you get when you over-compress uh, drums, which is a sort of wooshy, sort of pumpy feeling. And so I got that by uh, increasing this over here, the tension between uh, these two points, so that the peaks are all gonna all are gonna peak out and be distorted, but uh, everything else is gonna be is gonna act as if it has that compression on it. It's gonna be compression compressed normally. You can even see the compression activity through these here. Green green is extra gain applied, and purple is the gain taken away. Well, pur purple is the original signal. Let's put it that way, and then the the white is the signal that's going out. Indeed. So that's being crushed, the sensor being crushed, and then it's being crushed in the, in the master. And the whole point of this is that everything is being absolutely crushed. The whole reason why this works is because I have side chaining going on the kicks. Because the kick and the snare, which is all they play with the kick, is the loudest sound that happens in this track. <laughs> As they have the loudest sound on the track, uh, using side chain side chaining cuts the this the nice the, the nicest hole in the mix for them with for them with it to within which to fit words, and uh, it makes you know making the whole track louder way easier when you do that. Now there is more than one way to do that would make it fit like that. I am I have chosen to use compression uh, and side chaining. Not just because it makes the mix easier, but because also the pumping effect is a very style, stylistic thing to do for this type of music. Um, but if I wanted to, do, if I wanted to make it work without the pumping, there, what you would do is you would um, make everything fit EQ wise. And so, like, what that would mean is that in the kick, the kick here, I see that all these frequencies over here are, are where the kick lives. And I would go into the, the the bass channels, and then I would just scoop out those frequencies, so that the kick the kick could be loud and do that. And that's that's kind of what you would do for like uh, like a band recording or so, basically things that aren't dubstep or electro or drum and bass. Or well, sometimes you can do it for drum and bass because drum and bass isn't necessarily characterized by the uh, pumping effect. I just happen to like it, and. Uh, so that's just that's just something to keep in mind. It's not something that I'm terribly good at, mind you. I I do the side chaining and compression thing because it's the easy way out. It is the easiest way out ever. And I have mentioned before in um, another video that in when I do like metal stuff, my the the mixing and mastering process is way more complex and way more in depth because that stuff doesn't necessarily tolerate being distorted all the time. In the way that these things, these tracks do, and um, which is kind of counterintuitive, just because you think metal, oh, distorted everything and harsh vocals and drums, and when they just love distortion, it turns out no, no, it really doesn't, because it's actually a more rounder sound than you would uh, first consider, at least in comparison to something as harsh and solid sounding as electro. <laughs> I believe I covered everything. It was my assumption that I covered things that are. What does this automation clip do? Harmer modulation Y. Oh, I know what that one is. That's um the main base, and that's controlling uh, the prism amount, I think. Yep. So basically, the thickness and the thickness and squelchiness of the sound is being controlled by the this envelope here, and then its continuation down there and whatnot. And moving that around as the track plays, just to give it a more textual difference with itself. That's pretty much all that that is. Um, I believe I've covered everything. Um, if you have any questions, ask me, and I'll answer them if I'm able. I hope that this was informative. Um, if you want to get this uh, FLP for yourself to look at, if you haven't yet, um, the link to the original video should be in the description. And in that description, you can uh, pick up the FLP from uh, Black Octopus Sound. And it's uh, pay what you want. And you just pay whatever you want. And then uh, that'll, you can be, you can pay, you know, 30 cents or, you know, $10. Uh, 
just, just, just saying, just saying. But yeah, uh, have a good day. I hope you have learned. I hope that this was useful for you. And enjoy life. <laughs>